Hello, it's great to be back in Berlin um, and see so many familiar faces and also so many new faces. Um, yeah, it's very good. I'm very happy that I'm here today because um, I grew with this community and I consider it part of family to be here and it's always an honor to be here. Today we'll talk about um, a little bit what I did with uh, a sample I wrote and migrated that to an instant app um, and also taking a couple of steps beyond that for another thing that I'm currently working on. Um, so this is why it's not just install to instant but also beyond that. Um, and it's not actually a retrospective, it's a kind of catchy title, but mainly what it is is um, a story from what I, what I learned. Um, so firstly, um, there was a rebranding from instant apps or Android instant apps to Google Play Instant, which is um, a lot better for users because they don't really care about the like, instant apps, but it's, it's part of Google Play. That's why the, uh, the name that you will see in documentation is Google Play Instant. But underneath the hood for developers, um, it's still going to be, uh, the plugin's going to be Instant App and it's gonna, still going to be Instant App. So um, it's not going away, it's just been renamed. Um, one of the things that was with discovering apps is a bit tricky. Um, so it's just the background on what, why we made it and what we made with that. It's like discovering apps has always been tricky and um, finding the right app and uh, it involves a lot of searching and then, well, you first have to find the app and then you, know, you, you have to download the app and then you have to use it. And as you can see, there's a funnel, so you, use a lot of, you lose users on the way, on that funnel, on the process between um, they actually found something they want to use and they actually use it in the end and have it installed on their device. By now, uh, device, device space is not a big issue for many, but still for some. Um, so if the app is big and bloated, well, that's probably going to be, uh, retention is going to be a little bit lower uh, for, you, for the app than it would be for a smaller app. So that's one of the things that we're going to do with instant apps as well. Well, let's see what it, what it does and how it actually can work. So basically, I searched for the New York Times crossword. Um, and down here you can see on the search result that it says it has an instant app. And when I tap on that search result, what happens is the app opens immediately. I don't have to download it. I don't have to, uh, it has to be downloaded. But I don't have to install it. I don't have to go through the Play Store um, and actively decide, I want to download and install this app. But it can launch immediately. And you can go to today's, um, to today's crossword puzzle straight away from uh, that link from the search result. And it could be any link, actually. It's available to more than a billion of devices. And obviously, we're expanding that more and more. Um, and it's getting, getting more devices um, as we speak. Um, let's take a look at a couple of the requirements for development. Firstly, you have to target Lollipop or above. Well, that's already quite a lot of devices, because the platform changes that are required um, were introduced with Lollipop. So before that, instant apps won't work. That doesn't mean that you have to go for MinSDK uh, Lollipop for all of your app, but basically for targeting, at least targeting it um, to, to be Lollipop for your instant app. Android Studio 3.0 has been out for a while. It came with all the new features that we needed, so it came with uh, the uh, SDK it came with the Gradle plugins, the Instant App plugin, and the Feature plugin, uh, which are being used for, uh, for developing an Instant App. Also came with the AppLinks Assistant, which basically gives you an easy way to create a file that you can upload to your server. And the Play Store can then use that file to check whether the fingerprint that is in that file matches uh, the fingerprint of your certificate, and then can download the app. So you know, not anybody can. Um, claim any URL, but you have to have ownership of the URL, and this is uh, the tool that you can use to um, easily create it, uh, the file that, that you need to, to create this, um, this correlation. Also, the emulator supports it, so all the uh, emulator with Google Play services support, uh, uh, support Android and Synapse as well. And there's a refactoring tool, um, which we're still heavily developing, and uh, for Kotlin, we're working on that, um, and that's why I'm not going into too much depth of the refactoring tool, but I will go to the manual processes and the thought processes that you have to go through and what usually should go in which place. <clears throat> also, one thing for instant apps is that the downloadable, downloadable bundle size has to be less than four megabytes. Um, that means your base module and any given feature module that is on top of that is considered a downloadable bundle. So you've got base module of two megabytes and another uh, module on top of that which has one megabyte. It would mean three megabytes, that's fine. If you've got one that's five megabytes and one that's four, it doesn't work. Well, it would work, but um, 
we're not, uh, the policy says that you have to go for less than four megabytes. This is only relevant for production. So while you're developing, that doesn't really matter. But once you want to go into production builds and want to have this shipped to your users, you have to go for a um, low file size. I'll show you a couple of tricks and uh, tweaks that you can easily achieve that with without going into uh, too much trouble with um, just stripping out all the things that you don't you actually want to have in your app. So there's no need to um, limit yourself on, on functionality, um, rather splitting it up into different pieces. So let's take a look at what I did. Um, I migrated a real app. So Topeka is a sample that I've been working on for a while. Um, it actually was my starter project when I joined Google and kind of is still a thing that I've been working on over time. Um, what is it? It's a fun to play quiz that is available on GitHub. Um, you can check it out. You can see the codes that I'll show you today all on, the, all on GitHub already. Um, and the UI is basically uh, three pieces. The first is a sign-in screen. Second is the categories that you can select. And the third is the actual quiz itself. That's what we're going to end up with in features as well. So firstly, it was a monolith. And um, we're going to split up the app into those three different uh, feature modules. Um, like I said, I've been working on it for a while. So I started in 2014, then published it to GitHub uh, in May 15. Then I added Transitions API. Uh, added the, I lowered the min SDK level to 16 from 21, um, and then down to 14. So it's available on virtually all Android devices. Um, then in last year, uh, shortly after O, I published a version of that in Kotlin. So it's now completely rewritten in Kotlin. Um, so you can take a look at that as well. And now it's available um, as an instant app. But how did I do that? That's what we're going to focus on. Firstly, I went to the documentation. Well, I read up on it, and I saw what's going on, how do, what are the limitations, what are the benefits, what, have, what do I have to do? A couple of the things I already talked about. Um, and then I came up with a list. That list basically says, well, there's manual login in the app. Can't do that, so I have to take care of this. Um, also, it, the app is not URL addressable. I don't have any URLs associated with uh, my activities and with my entry points. Well, that wasn't supported by the time. By now, there is an API that you can use to, to change that. But URL addressability generally is a good thing if you have the possibility to make your app addressable via URLs. It makes it a lot easier um, in, in the long run um, to work with uh, modularized features. Also, the size was more than 4 megabytes. So that was not cool. Didn't work, um, at least for productions. Then I got cracking, I started working, and I just looked at what, what, what do I have to do, and started diving in. Uh, firstly, I looked at the SmartLock API, which is the um, preferred way of logging your users in. I don't know if you've uh, been using, for example, Netflix. Um, if you signed in once on an Android device, it stores uh, the credentials, and then later on you can retrieve them. Obviously, it's an opt-in process for a user, but um, after that, I, when I install Netflix on another uh, device, I don't have to sign in again. I just open it, and it's like, oh, you've been signed in. That's qu quite a cool feature, and it re reduces the friction for your users to um, actually um, go through the process of uh, remembering the password and typing everything. Autofill has been a good benefit to that as well, but this is even less friction. So it automatically signs in users. Like I said, it's less friction, and it's a lot faster to access the content on that. What we want to do is we want to be able to save the credentials the first time. Then we want to later on be able to retrieve them. And also, we have to hook into the activity result, because that's an external uh, service from your app point of view. And you have to get the result back, whether everything was successful, and you have to work with the credentials. So that's what we're going to do within the uh, app as well. Uh, firstly, within Kotlin, I created extension functions uh, for the API client to just give me the API client. Um, and that, we have the two methods that are relevant, is requesting and saving the uh, credentials. And uh, I also wrote a method, uh, function that allows me to um, intercept the, um, or apply stuff to the uh, activity result. Basically, I pass in two methods, uh, the success and the failure method. Um, and the success method basically gives me back the user, and I can work with that. The failure method, well, would it, does actual failure handling, as in there is no sign in data ready, so you have to first store it. And that's a whole different flow. Um, and with that, I don't have to do that within every activity, but all, all I have to do within the activity is implement the success method, pass it in, and the failure method, pass it in. Um, and just override the, override the uh, activity result, passing that in. Um, from the developer's point of view, the two methods that are cited at are actually relevant is requesting a login, where the method gets passed in transparently, uh, works its way through, and also you can log out. 
Um, so the API surface that I had to add for it is fairly small. And again, extension functions can be quite handy with that. Um, and I'm quite happy that we can do that with Kotlin this way. So first step done, cool. Ne let's move on to the next one. Um, that would be uh, URL addressability. Well, there is no website behind Topeka. There is, um, there is a different quiz which does different, similar things, but um, well, I haven't gone, gotten down to um, converging to them. So I just took a different URL. But basically what, what we're going to do is, um, in this case, like, a, like I showed it before, behind that search result is a URL. And behind anything that is an, can be an instant app is a URL. And that URL um, just can come from basically anywhere. It can come from within the system. Well, there's one exception, which means your default browser that will usually not link out to an instant app. But if you type in a uh, URL in, the, in your browser, it will stay there. Um, and it will not try and, and navigate you out of there uh, just for the sake of showing you the instant app instead. Um, so what I did is I changed the intent filters. The first important thing is to set this to auto-verify true, so the uh, Google Play Store can actually verify the URLs and the content in there. And then I add um, the data for the host and the path for that. And uh, schemes have to be both, uh, HTTP, HTTPS. There's multiple ways of declaring this. This is the one I found be the least redundant, so that's my preferred way of declaring these. And I do that for every ent entry point. You don't have to do that for every activity or every service, but for every part of the of your app that you want to have, be able to link directly into. Also, um, since in the future this will be modularized, we won't be able to access the class explicitly anymore. So that doesn't work. So intents have to be called a little bit differently. So we're passing the action view. We're adding a URL that we created before. Also, we set the category to default and browsable. And sometimes, because well, we're, we've got URLs and apps listen to URLs, you get a disambiguation dialog. Um, and in order to avoid that, all we have to do is uh, tell this intent that it is um, uh, designated for the package that we're going to, uh, that we want to have this, this in. Um, if you, during the modularization process, mess around with package, packages, make sure that um, you actually pass in the package that it's, de that it's um, designated to. So the, if you, my quiz activity would be in a sub-package called quiz, um, it has to be in the sub-package called quiz. Um, Quiz 2. So app is now URL addressable. Cool. Straightforward um, with, uh, the, with a couple of nice, easy features that have been there for a while. Um, so that's nothing like, too new. But next step is going to be a bit trickier. The size is more than 4 megabytes. So firstly, let me introduce um, the Gradle plugins that I'm going to use for modularizing. Firstly, I guess every Android developer in here. Who's, who's an Android developer in here, by the way? OK, who's not? OK, that is, uh, yeah, just briefly, this is the Gradle plugin that you apply um, to, to your application. This is the Gradle plugin that we will apply to an instant app. The instant app module, the Gradle module, will not host any code um, because that will simply be ignored. So all the code has to be in different modules. And there is the feature plugin. A feature plugin is basically um, a, an iteration on the library plugin. So for an application, it will create an AAR. And that AAR will then be compiled into the application in itself. For the Instant App plugin, it will create an APK, which then will be packaged into the um, uh, resulting file. So from that firstly existing uh, app module, I just moved that all to base. I just renamed it. And on top of that, I created an install module and an instant module. Base is using the feature plugin, um, and for um, yeah, basically using the feature plugin and installed is the um, APK, so it uses the application plugin. Instant is the AR, is the uh, is the instant app module, which uses which then gets the AR. And obviously, you have to set those in settings Gradle, otherwise Gradle won't know that they're there, and um, you will have to add them anyway. So that's. <clears throat> but with that, I didn't do anything for the size. So this is the prerequisite that I have to do um, to just get around playing around with instant app. The cool thing is at this point, if you don't want to ship it to users, but work with it internally, and even upload it to the Play Store to the development track, um, as long as your app is smaller than 20 megabytes, you can do that already. So you can play around with it. You can already give that to your team, to your product owners, and show them what you could do. And this is already your minimal viable product for, for working with an instant app and showcasing it. 
But this is not where we want to stop. So we want to go further. We want to see what we, want to do, what we can do with uh, feature modules and how we actually can go into the modularization bit. Um, like I said earlier, there is a couple of modules that we're going to cut out. We've got the base module already, and from that we're going to extract the categories module as well as a quiz module. So those can be downloaded later on separately. Um, and all of those get bundled into the uh, installed and instant um, modules later on. This was the point where I had to look into a lot of spaghetti code. Um, the cool thing is, after you're done with that, there is a lot. Uh, your architecture will be cleaner, and your code definitely will be cleaner because you can't have um, dependencies between those that are hard, and you won't have any cyclic dependencies. And definitely, after a modularizing app, it's going to be a cleaner code base to work with. Um, on that note, it's. If you don't want to go straight away into modularization, but general refactoring, it makes sense to have your um, package hierarchy more feature-wise um, than uh, layer-wise. And within those features, you can go w wild with whatever you want to have. But it makes it easier to extract those, module, uh, those packages already into its separate modules. So I've been shuffling stuff around. I uh, basically took all the shared code had that in base. So that means um, dependencies that I will expose with the API keyword. So many of you will be using um, the implementation keyword for Gradle. Um, if you want to expose your dependencies to other modules, you just flip from implementation to API. So you don't have to bundle them in every single package, but just bundle them in the base. Um, all the utilities are in there. So everything that's shared within utility classes and, and functions is in the base module. So other modules can access it as well. Um, also, the, the shared model classes, the whole data layer is in there. I've seen different approaches for different apps, um, which is fine as well. So if your app um, makes, if it makes sense for your app to have different um, repositories and also different databases in different uh, modules, well, fine. That's like this is not the one um, one one size fits all approach. It's the, the, the approach that I took and I found worked really well for me and for those apps and for that app. Also, uh, there's going to be shared resources in there, which means the application icon, which means strings that are being reused throughout the app, which means um, drawables and images that are being reused throughout the app. So um, just the stuff that's shared in there. So also colors and themes and styles. For, um, for some of your styles, uh, you could just have a, a blank implementation in the, uh, in the base module, which basically just means give it a name. And uh, the actual implementation is later on within the actual feature module. So you could do that to just keep it separate and clean on that level as well. Um, yeah, all the drawables that are shared in there, um, as well as strings and transitions that go from the base module to the um, to, to the feature modules. Um, if a feature module, if there's a feature module to feature module transition, you can have that in the uh, beginning or receiving feature module. But you always have to be very aware of where your stuff is being called from, because otherwise stuff won't work. Sometimes um, the system just doesn't display things, um, as in the framework is smart enough to not have your app crash. But if you have resources that have been moved around in package names as well, um, then you might just find that some things are not being displayed. And that has to do with those package names. One of the cool things about Kotlin, again, is that you can enable import aliasing. So you don't have to have the complete uh, package name every time you use the import. But you just say, this is my R base package name uh, that, I'm, that I'm using. So it's the R file of the base. Um, and I just used a, a drawable from this instead of from another one. So it happened to me. I've been bitten by that a couple of times that resources were there. but well, in the different package. Um, also, while you're modularizing, um, Gradle caches are not your best of friends because they're caching um, the pre-built things. And they will well tell you stuff is there already. Well, it's true because it's in the cache. But actually, it's been moved. Um, so you might find yourself in a bit of a weird situation sometimes with that. So, so make sure to disable those Gradle caches for the time you're modularizing um, if you want to save yourself a little bit of uh, headache. Um, so let's take a look at the other feature modules. I've been talking about a couple of things already, but uh, all the controllers are in there. So all my activities, all my fragments, all, um, all my uh, other things that are basically part of my controllers. Um, also, the custom views that I wrote and uh, the, UI the UI is in there. Also, the tests live with, uh, it makes sense to have the tests live within those feature modules as well and not have them in the base module. But you can run each because, well, basically, essentially everything, every um, 
So the feature plugin can, allows you to create APKs as well, so those can be installed on device, and you have a small test suite. So you could parallelize your tests easier and have them run um, in, in this modularized fashion as well. Also, each uh, feature module has its separate Android manifest with the activity declared in it um, to have that running as well. Um, drawables and assets that are within that module have to be in, that mod in, the, in those modules as well, so we don't, have, we don't load the base module, but keep that lean, as lean as possible, and um, have the big files uh, all, only in those feature modules. Um, yeah, and there's the package name changes. You saw I did one for base, I did one for categories, and I did one for quizzes, so I easily can see where stuff is coming from and how it actually works. But at this point, still, uh, the file size isn't any smaller, it's just distributed. Like, we've got separate files, but those files are still too big. That is where uh, the configuration APKs API comes in. Um, anybody has been dealing with multi-APKs? Okay, then just forget multi-APKs for this reason and for another reason that I'm gonna show you in a moment. Um, so there's the, uh, the configuration APK, APKs API allows you to split the APK that's being created into, uh, by screen, screen density, user language, or um, the processor architecture. Processor architecture, so your native code, can be quite substantial every now and then, but probably for most apps, the uh, screen density, so the resources, the drawables, and all that, that are um, specific to sp uh, screen density are there, but they're not being used. So, um, well, if we split that up, what happens is um, in your app so far, you have all of those, but actually you just use one of them. With the configuration APKs API, what, it, what happens is there's uh, different APKs for each screen density. And for a triple X HDPI, what happens is a base APK will be installed, which is devoid of resources, as well as this other APK uh, with the triple X HDPI APK will be installed. So um, no need to fumble with multi APKs, but on the other hand, you can easily just have this with a very straightforward um, set of Gradle rules in there. So instead of having those three APKs, there is loads and loads and loads of APKs that are being produced. All of them are being bundled in the Instant App uh, zip file and uh, can be uploaded to the Play Store as is, and the Play Store decides what to ship to the user. I've heard a question before, which is, oh, and what happens if the language changes, if the user changes language, and I've got the German one installed, um, and it changes to English, or they change to English, what happens is that the Play Store tries and download that um, APK as soon as possible, and as soon as it's ready and available, uh, it will switch the resources over to, um, to, to, your, new, to your new language. That might require an application restart, um, but it depends on the operating system level as well as um, on the way you integrate all that. Um, and, it's, and how fast it is. And that was being done transparently and in the background. So with that, we went under the file size limit, so that's quite handy, and I'm very happy that we went there with like, fairly uh, little effort. It's been, it's, it took a while, but comparing it to um, not being able to, to um, use instant apps on the one hand, and on the other hand, not being able to um, have a clean architecture, this, like, this is completely fair enough, and the tools help you a lot with that as well. So another thing is uh, ProGuard. Who in here obfuscates their app or uses minification uh, of ProGuard or Gradle? Wow, OK. Um, one thing you have to keep in mind is with that, you have become a library developer. And you expose APIs from one module to the other. So make sure that your API surfaces are there. Because if they're not, uh, if you obfuscate your classes and your methods that you're calling from a different uh, module, they're the module doesn't know that, it's, that it should work, and it will, you will get crashes at runtime. So you will have to have um, all, the, all the things in base, you have to have all your API services in there, um, have to be kept by Gradle rules, um, uh, by, by uh, ProGuard rules. One of the cool things is you can use the APK inspector and just go in there, and um, if you see a class that you want to keep, you can right-click on it and say, generate ProGuard rules, and generate keep rules, and you can select from a couple of kept rules, and you can copy paste that into your uh, program configuration file, so you don't have to think, oh, was it keep which package, which is it one or two asterisks? Uh, how does this? It just generates that automatically for you. All you have to do is copy paste it. There's a good article as well from my colleague Wojtek uh, on enabling ProGuard in an Android instant app. Um, that was the the first part of this presentation. So the takeaways so far are um, firstly make sure that you know what your prerequisites are. 
So it could be the URLs that you have to introduce. It could be smart lock. There's a couple of APIs that are restricted to make sure that uh, an instant app, which is um, transparently installed, uh, is transparently downloaded and run on the user's device, doesn't do any shenanigans. Same with a couple of permissions that have been locked down. So for example, you can't access um, content providers that are not explicitly being exposed to an Android instant app. Also, um, your, expose, uh, your uh, content providers that you expose, well, they won't be accessible by uh, local apps as well, uh, local apps either. Um, also, refactor one feature at a time. Don't try and do everything at once. Just take the first feature that you think makes sense and uh, put everything in a base module and then just take it step by step. Because if you go for everything at once, you will have an app that you can't ship anymore. And that is the thing where usually you should have, um, like, that, that's a creeping feeling on the back of your neck when somebody says, oh, we have to ship. And like, yeah, we can ship in two weeks' time. And all the users will see, st will see bad things in the meantime, or no f new features are being shipped. So that would be really bad. So take one feature, refactor that, and make sure that your app still works. Um, also, you have to apply those new plugins um, and adhere to the size constraint of the uh, Android Instant app. The next step would be uh, linking it to an actual domain using app links, also uploading it to the Play Store, and maybe working with Android App Bundle and dynamic delivery which is a cool new thing that we introduced uh, at I.O. this year. Um, who here already uploads an app bundle to the Play Store? OK. All right, I will show you why you should. Um, we've been working on an app called Plaid. Uh, my colleague, Nick Butcher, has been uh, the main contributor to it, and he started the whole thing. And we are currently rewriting it. Um, there's a massive effort. So one of the parts is we are um, Modularizing it, which I did just recently, so that's why um, it's not in the um, in the abstract and in the title, well, in the title of the presentation here, but not in the one on the program. Um, so we went underwent this whole massive refactoring. We're going to rewrite it. Um, basically, it's going to be complete massive overhaul of the app. What it does, um, it also showcases material design, uh, transitions, animations in a real-world scenario. So it has external news sources um, that it pulls in data from. You can comment on stuff. You can there's logins. There's like multiple things that are uh, make it a, a way more real-world scenario than Topeka, which is a local-only app. So there is um, there is also data that comes from the internet. Um, and again, if you haven't seen it before, it's a beautiful app. Play around with it. Um, and there's it's all open source on GitHub, so you can just get it from there. One of the first things we did is uh, use Android App Bundle. Um, Android App Bundle is the new packaging format for uh, Android apps, which we introduced and announced at I.O. 2018. So you can upload your app already in an App Bundle. Um, and we'll give you a couple of benefits. So I'll talk about the benefits later in this, in this presentation. So again, getting started is uh, you go to the documentation, and it's g.co Android, Android App Bundle. And from there, uh, you go for, towards the next step. What does App Bundle do? Um, it's fairly similar to the Configuration APK's API, but with even less effort. So you've got one master APK, which is all your code that is um, not that is shared between different densities and languages, or CPU architectures, or um, yeah, the density as well. So and that will be generated. And there's a multitude of APKs that you will have that you will end up with after creating a um, an Android app bundle. And for a triple X HDPI device, it uh, for x86, it only uh, installs these three modules, uh, these four modules. Sorry, the, the master is there as well. And for um, the f just this change to upload an app to build an app bundle, which is a, an action that you can do within Android Studio or even within um, within Gradle directly, you can just say Gradle wrapper bundle, and you will get a bundle. Uh, we had a, an APK size of plat of 8.6 megabytes, and for the same phone, so for a triple X HDPI device, uh, we went down to 4.2 megabytes. So that's uh, less than 50% of the starting size, and all I have to do is generate an app bundle instead of an APK. So that's big. Well, not anymore, but. Um, so, we, but we don't just utilize app bundles. Uh, there's a couple of Gradle plugins that we use. Well, there's new Gradle plugins as well. Um, so there's the application plugin, there's a library plugin that we use for that, and there's a dynamic feature plugin, which basically is um, a, um, another feature for dynamic features we'll talk about in a minute. Um, 
And uh, with, with these three plugins that we, got, that we used within the modularization, um, we created good ways to uh, have an unbundled architecture of the application. So what do we do? There's obviously the core of the app, which was the base module within, uh, within Topeka, so I kept the same name. It's, it, it's the uh, base of the app. And it uses the application plugin for um, the stuff that was in app before, it's the home activity, and a few resources that are around that, which I already said earlier, like, so I'm not going into too much detail here. Also, there's a library plugin for a couple of things that are fairly close to the um, application, but should be, could be unbundled in order to uh, decrease build times. And if there is no changes in there, they, uh, the Gradle doesn't have to rebuild everything uh, every time. So um, everything in base is a shared code and resources. It's a library plugin, so it can be re reused throughout different, um, throughout, uh, different uh, feature modules later on. Also, there is uh, the external dependencies that all reside in base. So again, the API keyword instead of the implementation keyword. And there is search. Firstly, I had search in a dynamic feature module, but since search is one of those things that is, it, it's transparently overlaid over the home activity, and there's a transition going on between that, uh, we couldn't completely unbundle it. And because of that, we just put it into a library for now. We might completely unbundle it into a dynamic feature module, but currently that didn't work because, well, there is still a couple of hard dependencies, and we wanted to get the, moder uh, the first bits of the modularization out of the door as quickly as possible. So library plugins always is a good choice if, you're, if you can't fully unbundle everything and you want to have dependencies that are um, included into a, bigger, uh, into a bigger APK later on. Well, and there's the feature modules. Dynamic features uh, is one of the cool things that we, um, we also introduced. It's currently in beta, so you can't really ship to your users with that yet. But you can play around with it locally. And what it does is allows you to do, do dynamic code loading. So there is a, an official way to, um, to just call an API and tell the API, give me the new feature. And it downloads it, installs it, and then you can run it straight away. That uses a dynamic feature plugin. Um, all the separable activities are in there, and the resources local to that. So in this case, it's uh, three news sources, or two news sources, uh, designer news, dribble, and the about screen. Well, about screen, why? Well, mainly because we could. Um, and you can still, in the end, decide you want to bundle this within the um, initial application in the first place. But we don't have, we were working on gathering data, how many people actually click on it. So features that are not being used by all of your users, but by a subset of them, be it expert users or be it um, just a, a part of users that are um, maybe paying for parts of your service, um, you can put those in feature modules and download them later on. So not every user has to get them in the first place. And that's one of the reasons why we put all of those out there. Um, and maybe if we add new sources in the future, we can easily, because we already have the API surfaces quite clear, uh, we can easily have new modules that we add on top of that. And at, at the side of that, so instead of designing a new Dribble, we could add material up or whatever to that as well and fairly quickly integrate it within the app and keep it clean and encapsulated as well and download it if the user enable those new sources on the, on the app. So how does it like, look in like, a more graphical way? Um, we've got the app, which uses the application plugin. Uh, we've got the three libraries, uh, which is shared search and bypass, which is a native library, which, well, because of app bundles, like I said earlier, uh, is being split up into different CPU architectures. You don't have to have all the CPU architecture uh, as O files into one single uh, APK, but you only get the one that you actually need. And on the other hand, there's the uh, three dynamic features. Um, the way that it, that they depend on one another is everything, uh, the, the app depends on the three library plugins. And within the app, there's also a declaration of the dynamic features. And the dynamic features um, also declare that they're uh, dependent on the application. Well, that's not a hard dependency as in a compile dependency, but it's more, you can use the resources once you've done that, and you can work with um, stuff that is in base, uh, in, in, the ba in the base modules or in the app module, and you can use those straight away from there. Um, I said earlier that, the, that you don't have to have URLs for instant apps to work anymore. That's the same thing, that's the same um, logic behind that and the same mechanism behind it that we uh, use for dynamic delivery. Um, that's the Google Play Core API. That's an API that enables you to uh, get, um, get, get modules later on in, um, in your install cycle, so not at the first place. Um, you can request modules either and delete them, and you can do that immediately or deferred. So you can say, I want to download this now because the user clicked on something, and I actually have to show a blocking action to say, we're downloading this, 
Or, on the other hand, um, you can download features deferred. So you can say, well, I'm pretty sure this user wants to get this at some point, um, so I'm just downloading it. So for example, you've got a game, and with that game, you have the first 10 levels into the, into the uh, base module, it's already installed, and you can add later stuff later on, and you can download that later on. Or even resources or assets that you don't want to download in the first place, you can just have them um, as dynamic features and download them later on within the uh, process. Um, how does it work? You've got the uh, split install manager factory. You create it for an activity that you're running in. Um, and then with an install method, uh, what I did is I just checked if the, if the module is already installed. If it's already installed, then I call unsuccessful load, which is my callback to just say, this is done already. Um, we can continue. And if not, what I do is I create the builder, add the module, and build, and on, then you call the manager to uh, start my installation request. So it's a fairly straightforward API as well. And um, we can just go ahead from there. And within my unsuccessful load, is what I do is I just call a uh, set class name for the package and class name. Again, this can't be, uh, this could be with, with, with URLs, it could just be the URL. Without URLs, I can't explicitly use the class that we, that we had in the first place because, well, we don't, the base module doesn't know that it's there. Um, and we start the activity. Straightforward uh, Android development as you're already used to with a couple of benefits, which means dynamic code loading um, straight out of the box without. Um, so like I said, to recap that, is you can upload the Android app bundle already today. You can just build it, ship it. And your users will get smaller APKs, which are optimized for a device. You can use the bundle tool locally, which is a tool that's available on GitHub, um, which, um, and to build and uh, deploy your bundles to your local app, to your, to your uh, devices locally in order to test all those configurations that you could have. Um, so you can do everything locally already. And you can introduce dynamic delivery, which um, allows you to, well, be even more fine-grained with that and it allows, you, allows your users to only have stuff in, on the device that they actually need and that they're actually using. And you can install or delete modules as needed. With that, that's the second step of takeaways, and I promise this will be the last slide on that. Um, you can easily release the app bundle today. And if you don't want to, um, please talk to me later on, and I, I'm happy to, to hear what's going on and why, um, why it doesn't work for your use case. Um, also, faster delivery makes your users happier because um, it makes uh, the app a lot usable, uh, more usable and faster usable. Um, and map out your plan before you start modularizing. Don't just jump in and modularize everything, but make sure that you kind of have a plan of where you're going. You can add dynamic delivery at any point. You can use a dynamic feature module in the first place and uh, later on add dynamic delivery um, so you don't have to do that all in one go but you have modules already and can easily switch from either a library module or a dynamic uh, feature module to, the, um, to, you, to also adding the Play Core, Play Core API. And again, work with one feature at a time. Don't do everything at once. There's a couple of resources. Um, the source code for both of the samples is available on GitHub. There's uh, more samples for Android and Synapse and for dynamic features. Um, you can check them out. It's got all the codes that I showed in there. Um, there's a, the blog post, and there's documentations for instant apps and a bundle. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions. If not, I'm here. I'm Okay, uh, if you have a question, other than can I have a sticker, I've got stickers for questions. Ooh. Can I get a sticker? <laughs> yes, but not for this question and later on. Uh, Just find me later. So can I shift oh, to uh, an Android bundle? I release the Android bundle, then... Ah, oh, there you are. So I release the Android bundle, then, but I want to release the non-Android bundle APK. Yeah. That is possible. Yeah. Oh. It's not, it's not a one-way road, and you can upload both. And it, underneath the hood, what happens is it installs mul a multitude of APKs instead of one APK. But okay. going back, I don't see why it m would make sense, other than you, you're experiencing issues. And if you're experiencing yeah. issues, please 
Let me know. Um, That's we'll the only reason. If there is an issue and I want to revert and. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Uh, so my question is about the single activity pattern. Yeah. Uh, how do you approach that, or are, are you going to approach that topic in the Plaid or in the topic? Um, there is not one activity within Plaid, and there's multiple of them. It makes sense. Sorry. Just first the questions, and uh, I'm going to give more stickers later on. Um, <laughs> so. Um, it's not one activity within Plaid at the moment, and we don't plan to make it just one activity. Um, the navigation component and the single activity pattern that is uh, recommended in there works for several apps. It doesn't work for all apps, and you, don't, okay. you should not refactor your application uh, to have one single activity just for the sake of it. If it works for you, it works. But on the other hand, the navigation uh, component gives you ways to easily link between activities as well. And I've got a sample currently under review which is um, just addressing that. How oh. can you do multiple features, multiple modules with uh, different activities and how can those be addressed? Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. I have one question regarding yeah. the dynamic feature Gradle plugin yeah. and how it correlates with the actual uh, Instant App feature plugin. Yeah. Do um, they support each other or not? And yes. Whether uh, if you take a look at the documentation, it already says that coming soon we're going to converge those and it's going to be uh, one thing that you can both uh, if you use uh, dynamic delivery, you can already ha also have the Instant App benefits. And one of the samples that is okay, out but, there but already. Right now, if I have an instant app, for instance, yeah. can I just right now can I just move to app bundles or not? Uh, you not can yet. create an app bundle, yes. But dynamic delivery, um, you can't do that straight away. What you would have to do is you would have to take all the code that's in the in, in the feature modules and take that a level lower to a library okay. and have a dynamic feature and a feature plugin. I know. It's a bit more work right now, but like I said, it's going to be converging in the future. And um, so we have some plans to like. Make sorry, it, you have some plans to like make it make yes, it easier. Yes, yes, it's going to converge, and that's a, that's the plan. Yeah, cool. Thank right. you. Hey, do you have any data on app sizes and uh, download rate or uninstall rate? Uh, like, I'm a developer, and I want to convince my product manager that this is a thing we should do. Is there any data around that? Um, it, well, there definitely is data. I don't know uh, what we have shared publicly on you know that, but as you saw, like for for our sample app, it decreased the file size for the largest configuration possible, for uh, by less. It, we now have less than 50% of the first uh, of the of the of the file size that we started off with. So even just for that, it's absolutely worth it. And whoa. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's it's um, it definitely decreases the file size by a lot, and the data is uh, it's I'd, I'd rather not say that because I'm not 100 percent sure that this is right, but um, there is a co strong correlation between file size and people not downloading the app or um, not going to um, to keep it on their device. So smaller apps basically means that your users will keep 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 the keep the app longer on their device as well as download. It's going to be more likely.